Hello. Uh, great to see so many of you here. My name's Matthew Garrett. I work for Red Hat. I'm wearing a corporately compliant t-shirt today, so if anybody's looking for me later, I should be easy enough to find. I work on power management. I used to mostly concentrate on mobile devices, mostly in the laptop area. I've done a small amount of embedded work in the past. Nowadays, I work for Red Hat, and so as a result, I care about big computers that make lots of noise. But it turns out that we want power management there as well. This is just background. So obviously, I have no particular stake in Android's related discussions. I'm currently carrying an Android phone that Google gave me. Um, on the other hand, I previously ended up interviewing for a job on Android and didn't get it. So I think that's pretty much full disclosure on all fronts. <laughs> so uh, if I have any biases, they're complex. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Android and Linux and the interaction between the two, primarily from the point of view of a specific technical aspect of the Android design and the uh, discussions, shall we say, that have arisen from it. Uh, so to start off with, we should really just define what we're talking about. Linux. If you really feel that this needs to be answered, then you may be better off being somewhere else at the moment. But uh, I hope that things will be relatively clear in any case. What is Android? Android is a mobile operating system. It's mostly targeted at embedded platforms. So right now, you're mostly looking at phones and increasingly tablets. Um, it's a, oh, yeah, sorry, I should, I should avoid doing that. Whoops, sorry. Yeah, uh, this is turning into an adventure, right. <laughs> if I can get through this without falling over anyone, then I'm doing well. So Android is an operating system. It's primarily under a uh, Apache BSD style license. It's other than the Linux kernel, it shares pretty much nothing in common with the majority of operating systems that you would generally consider Linux. It has its own C library that's, I think, originally at some level derived from a BSD C library. It has a completely independently written user space stack on top of that. I believe the only other shared component that's really well related to a standard Linux distribution is the Bluetooth user space stack. Though I think somebody told me this at some point that might be rewritten as well. And part of this is due to the fact that handset vendors would prefer not to have to worry too much about GPL compliance. They don't want to be concerned that code that they write, they'll then be forced to publish for the benefit of their competitors. So for the most part, the relevant aspect of Android to us as the greater Linux community is probably the work that they've done on the Android kernel. And Android is a the majority of Android devices run on ARM. Uh, there's a MIPS port, though I don't know whether that code is completely upstream. And obviously, there's x86 as well. And right now, the x86 is primarily used for software development purposes. You write on an x86 device when you're targeting an ARM device. But I believe that there have been, uh, I think Asus, perhaps, are talking about providing an Android-based netbook. So there's a certain amount of x86 in there as well. Android is apparently now, uh, these figures are from some report that was published relatively recently, so I don't think they're too far off. But apparently it's at this point 13% of the total smartphone network, by which I mean of the smartphones that are in the market that people currently have, 13% of them are Android which isn't bad given that Android as a platform only really started shipping in mid-2008. So we're looking at two years to get 13% of the market. Apparently, 27% of the phones sold, of the smartphones sold in the first half of 2010 were Android devices. And as I mentioned before, we're starting to see Android appearing on tablet devices. Uh, right now, many of those devices are coming out of China and are not in fact, in any way, shape, or form GPL compliant, but 
that's not actually Google's fault. So based on the stated activation figures, uh, apparently something like 300,000 Android devices get activated every day, which works out at, uh, did I say 300? Well, somewhere between six and nine million or something device Android phones sold a month. So we're talking about a huge number of Linux devices that are getting out into people's hands. There are many people now running Linux on their phone. How many people here have an Android phone? <laughs> right. How many of you have a Linux running phone that isn't Android? How many of you work for Nokia? <laughs> okay, so right now, um, the Android market is the prime Linux player in the phone market. And with the growth of Mego, as Mego becomes a more solid platform, we may see that starting to change. But right now, I think it's fair to say that the Linux phone market is dominated by Android. And when you're talking about selling huge numbers of devices, oddly enough, you then tend to see that there are lots of companies who are interested in getting a slice of that market. Even a small slice of the Android market is a large number of units shifted. And obviously, that's an opportunity to make piles of money, which is apparently what we're interested in here. So we're increasingly seeing new hardware platforms running Linux uh, as a result of the interest in Android. We have now many new system-on-chip vendors. Um, there's a large number coming out of China and Taiwan, which are being designed primarily to run Android. You have vendors doing their Linux ports in order to run Android on these devices. And you don't necessarily see this code going upstream because they provide the source codes to companies and then those companies ship their Android devices. Nobody cares about updating the kernel because you only really need to update the kernel on an Android device if you're updating to a later version of Android. And if you're looking at a small profit margin, then many companies will never bother doing that. If you want to get to a later version of Android, you may have to buy a new, more modern device instead. So there's not much direct incentive for many of the companies to get their code into the mainline kernel. But as kernel developers, we would love to get this code into the kernel because, well, um, sometimes it's just because you buy a device and maybe you want to actually run a later version of the kernel anyway. Or sometimes it's because when we get code from external contributors, especially contributors who have not worked with the Linux community before, we get new approaches to existing problems. And a lot of the time, the response to this is, ah, that's horrible. But sometimes you see some code that gives you new insights into what a problem, uh, into the problem space. Sometimes you have the opportunity to use contributed code to reshape existing code in the kernel in a better way for everybody. So we want to see the code from these SOC vendors, and ideally we want to get it into the mainline kernel. And there should be some benefits to the SOC vendor for that, because then nominally whenever we do things that break their code, we fix their code. Um, that sometimes even works. And there's benefit to us in the ways I've described. So we would like these vendors to be targeting mainline rather than just targeting Android. It also potentially means that they can sell into markets that are not looking for Androids, but are looking for Linux. So, The Android user space, as I mentioned, is something that doesn't have a great deal in common with a typical Linux user space. Android relies on certain bits of kernel functionality that are not part of the mainline kernel. Uh, so an example of this is something called the binder, which provides for inter-process communication within Android. It's a uh, set of code that has a convoluted history where it derives from BOS in some manner, and then it went via Palm, and then it ended up in Android. Uh, most kernel developers are pretty willing to say that the chances of the binder code ending up mainline are pretty close to zero. But the binder is an external driver. It's something that you can patch into a Linux kernel and then run Android on. That's not too much of a problem. The problem is more that 
some of the Android-specific kernel functionality ends up in the drivers. And the drivers are generally the interesting bits of the external ports of Linux. They're the code that we want to integrate to mainline. Sometimes, oh, when I mentioned the benefits to us, sometimes it's that even an SOC vendor will have some ancillary hardware that also appears in other places. It's really irritating to spend time writing a driver for something and then find that actually somebody else wrote a driver for the same piece of hardware two years earlier, but the code is sitting on an FTP server in Taiwan. It's a lot easier to find code that's already written if it's in the mainline kernel, so we like that. So we want the drivers merged, but if the drivers rely upon Android-specific functionality, then it's difficult for us to merge those drivers. We can only, either we need to remove the Android-specific functionality, which means you've then got two versions of the driver. You've got the Android version and the Linux version, and then if the vendor updates the Android version, somebody has to make sure that those changes get copied into the Linux version as well. That's not ideal. We pretty much want to be able to get into a situation where we can take Android drivers and put them in the mainline kernel without any modification other than style issues or bug fixing, and then those are things that should also apply to the Android version. That we don't want there to be a distinction between an Android driver and a Linux driver. We want those two concepts to be the same thing. You may have heard the term wake locks. Um, Anyone who's read Linux kernel or Linux PM or my inbox lately will have seen lengthy, tortuous discussions that seem to go around in small circles. Uh, but part of the problem is that there's not necessarily a great understanding of the problem that wake clocks are trying to solve. Application authors really like their applications to do things. And the problem is that it's a lot easier usually to write an application that does something by consuming lots of resources than it is to write an application that does something by not consuming lots of resources. Application authors can't be trusted. Application authors are the enemy. Application authors exist to make your phone do more for a very short period of time and then turn itself off. <laughs> And there are multiple ways of dealing with this. If you're Apple, then every time an application author attempts to publish an application, you spend three weeks looking at the application and then forget to return their phone calls. And then maybe they get to sell it at some point, and then you arbitrarily remove it from the App Store later. But the advantage of that approach is that there is the opportunity for somebody to say, no, this application does not meet our basic quality requirements. It consumes too much CPU time. It does it even when it's idle. It's a bad application. We should prevent this application from getting onto people's phones. The Mego approach has so far to be, I believe, rather than there being a corporate approach to that, there's a community-based review process that can, again, prevent applications ending up in the official application store unless they meet certain quality guidelines. Android I, has a more open process of uh, you can upload an application to the Android market that then copies people's phone book details and sends them to you. And then eventually, if Google noticed, then that application will get pulled. But if you don't have this review process, then it's easier for application authors to get utter crap onto your phone. And the upside of that is that it's the barrier of entry to the application authors is much lower. The entire process is much more transparent. Application authors like that. You can get people developing for your platform without them having to jump through the hoops that they have to jump through for Apple. So you can see why this approach is desirable. And in some ways, it's difficult to say that we should be in favor of a more closed application distribution process. Uh, in general, Linux people seem to feel that it should be straightforward for people to get their applications onto users' devices. We should be reducing barriers, not uh, raising them. But if you have the opportunity for vendors or for application authors to put arbitrary applications in your market, then if the user downloads that application and your application spends its entire time consuming energy, uh, consuming battery power, then the user is going to get to the point of feeling that this phone isn't a very useful phone because it runs out of battery after three hours. 
And that's not the vendor's fault. That is the application author's fault. But it's not clear that you can easily tell the user that this is the application that is causing the problem. So if you can control the behavior of applications, if you can take an arbitrary badly written application and ensure that that application cannot kill the battery life of a device, then your platform is potentially more attractive to the user. You've managed to mitigate the fact that you're allowing arbitrary application authors to upload arbitrary applications that sit dividing one by two, 3,000 times a millisecond. So there's an obvious incentive to have your platform be resilient. I'm going to provide a technical overview of what wake lots do and how Google solved this problem. If you have an Android phone, and if the screen is turned off, then the likely case is that it just puts itself into a full system suspend. And when you say a full system suspend, then that's effectively equivalent to if you have a laptop when you suspend it. The system is put into a low power state, and nothing is running. We're no longer scheduling processes. So if there's an application that was sitting there consuming all your CPU, that application is no longer running. The downside is that no other applications are running either, even well-behaved applications. But you've prevented that application from consuming power when the user is not actively using the phone. So it's a straightforward mitigation technique. If you can't trust the applications to be well-behaved in terms of resource utilization, don't let the applications run. Problem solved. Other vendors have taken another, a different approach. Uh, on a PC, if you go into an ACPI suspend state, then, as you said, we stop all processes. But that's also the only way that we can get into this low power state. When you go into a system suspend on a laptop, Linux suspends devices as much as Linux can, but then Linux writes to a magic address. And at that point, the system firmware takes over, and the system firmware does things like cut the power to various components. And we don't know how to do that, because that differs between every single laptop. And in some cases, that will differ based on the BIOS version. So we cannot enter an equivalent power state to ACPI suspend just from software. We have to suspend the entire machine. In the embedded world, it's different. The majority of modern embedded devices give you full software control over all this power functionality. So the difference between software suspend and a runtime idle suspend is zero in terms of power consumption. Instead, the difference is that in one of them, the system will start running code the next time an application is scheduled to run, whereas in the system suspend state, nothing will be run until a wake-up event is received. So when we say wake-up event, we may mean that the user has pressed a power button, but it may also be that a driver has said, I need to be woken up in 10 minutes so that I can query the battery state so as I can check that the battery temperature is within normal parameters so as I can check that it's not discharging too quickly. So the Android opportunistic suspend approach is a straightforward way of handling the untrusted, badly written application problem. And it doesn't even require that much code. But there's a problem with it. And that problem is what happens if I hit a button at exactly the same time as my phone decides to go to sleep? <laughs> if you do that, then there's a risk that you will make the decision to go to sleep, a button will be pressed, and then you'll go to sleep the button will not necessarily cause the system to wake up. The button will be received by the kernel. The kernel will, tell, will be in the process of telling user space that this button was pressed. But at the same time, user space will be telling the kernel to go to sleep. So that's bad. In the case of a power button, it's not too much of a problem. Because the user presses the power button, nothing happens. The user presses the power button again, and the system comes on. And in fact, sometimes that happens on my Android for reasons I don't understand. I press the power button, nothing happens. And I press it again, the screen comes on, and then turns off again immediately. But the power button is something we can deal with. And what happens if it's a phone call instead? A phone call may be a wake-up event. 
Weight clocks are a mechanism that allows you to avoid losing wake up events in this small window when you're trying to go to sleep. So say the user puts their phone down or puts it in their pocket. After a short period of time, when the phone is idle, when the screen is off, and if nothing is saying, I need to do some work, the system will decide to suspend. But say that, as I said again, as the system is in the process of deciding to suspend, you get a phone call. The baseband driver, the bit of the kernel that's communicating with the phone hard, the uh, GSM hardware, is receives the interrupt from the baseband and then takes a wake clock. And that wake clock pre uh, prevents the system from going to sleep. But there's still a problem in that you need to at some point let the phone go back to sleep. So user space then, say uh, user space is selecting on a device node that communicates between the baseband and user space. User space is then selecting on that and gets woken up and scheduled because there's an incoming event from the baseband driver. User space then takes its own wake clock, which will then prevent the system from going to sleep, and then reads the event, realizes that the phone is ringing, and then makes noise and puts up the phone screen. So the user then answers the phone, talks to somebody for a while, and then puts the phone down, and at that point, user space releases its wake clock. The kernel released its wake clock when it knew that the wake up event had been received by user space. And then the phone immediately goes to sleep again. Wake clocks are designed for this purpose. They are designed to ensure that there is no race condition that exists between you going to sleep and a wake up event being received. Now, this is something that, in principle, can also happen outside the Android world. If I hit the sleep key on my laptop and the system starts going to sleep, and at the same time, a wake on LAN packet arrives, the system will go to sleep. Now, for me, as a laptop, that's not too much of a problem, because I probably didn't care about the wake on LAN packet. If I was suspending the laptop, I'm probably about to pick it up and walk off. But instead, it could be that rather than a laptop, it was a server, and the scheduler wanted to start a job running on that server and so sent it awake on land packet because it wasn't sure whether it was awake or not. And at that precise moment, the server decided to go to sleep because it's been idle for 30 seconds, uh, for 30 minutes. And then you're going to have a machine that's asleep even though you sent it the packet to wake it up. So uh, arguably we have to get into slightly convoluted, not necessarily very realistic situations to say that this is a problem outside Android, but it does exist and it could potentially cause problems in very specific use cases. Android needed to solve this problem because they suspend much more aggressively, whereas a laptop may be woken up and suspended maybe 10 times a day if you're really actively carrying it around. An Android phone will go to sleep and wake up well, in the case of the Nexus One, it'll have to do it at least every 10 minutes because it needs to check the battery state. So you're much more likely to hit this race condition. Now, there was much more incentive for Google to attempt to solve it. We can get to that later. Right, so back in 2008, there was... Android was released. There was some unhappiness that the Android kernel had all this additional functionality that wasn't in mainline, and there wasn't a lot of active work from Google attempting to get their code into mainline. So after various people were slightly unhappy about this, at the start of 2009, the wake clock code was initially posted to the Linux power management mailing list for discussion. Uh, it was, in fact, a combination of two things. The patch says included support for wake clocks, and it also included something called early suspend, which I'll get to a bit later. February 2009, there was a follow-up posting. There were a couple of minor semantic changes that came as a result of some of the conversation. 
And then a third version was posted in February 2009 in an attempt to deal with most of the coding style issues. The design didn't get significantly changed. Then nothing much happened. Um, various people were unhappy about the wake lock design. Uh, it wasn't clear what problem they were trying to solve. And by and large, there, uh, there was no, basically nobody other than Google seemed interested in getting the code into mainline. And Google didn't seem that interested either. So nothing happened. And then towards the end of 2009, early 2010, some kernel developers started making noises about Google being a poor community member on the grounds that this code was still out of tree and nobody seemed to have any desire to get it mainline. So there was a meeting at the Linux Foundation Collaboration Summit uh, in April in an attempt to, between some Google engineers and some kernel developers, in an attempt to identify the problem see if we could come up with any alternative solutions. And if we couldn't come up with any alternative solutions, then figure out how we could make white clocks more palatable to the larger kernel community. And in May, they got posted again. And uh, there was some discussion. <laughs> and white clocks are still not mainline. So I, you can probably guess how that discussion went. Uh, but it's interesting to look at what the problems with wake locks are from a technical perspective. And the first is that every driver that can receive a wake-up event needs to have wake lock code added to it. You need to flag in the driver that a wake-up event was received. And then you can get into arguments about, well, my platform may treat this as a wake-up event. This other platform may not. How do we handle that case? Uh, it was perceived as working around application bugs. If you can go into a deep, an equivalent to suspend deep idle state in your idle loop, then there is no race here, because the scheduler will just make sure that anything that is listening for, anything that's meant to handle a wake-up event will be scheduled and run. The reason, as I said, that Google did not take the idle loop uh, runtime suspend approach is that if you have any applications that consume CPU time when, they're, when they should be idle, then that destroys your power management story. You know, if you're using a your phone to browse web pages, you'll generally get maybe a couple of hours of battery life. If you're carrying a phone in your pocket, then it should be a couple of days. A poorly behaved application can be an order of magnitude difference in your battery life. So if instead we could fix all the applications, it wouldn't be a problem. We wouldn't need to implement this. We wouldn't need this ugly code in every driver. So there's a perception that this was the kernel attempting to fix user spaces bugs, and user space should just fix its own bugs. You can ask questions at the end. Also, you know where I work. And the other problem is that if you have wake locks, then you still need some way for user space to indicate that it has consumed the event. If you don't have that, then if you have a platform with wake lock code in it, but which doesn't have a wake lock aware user space, once you get a wake up event, the system will never go to sleep again because you'll never be able to say, I've handled this event. So the code is only advantageous if you have a user space that has been designed to cope with it. That's not entirely true. There's a couple of cases where the kernel can identify that user space has consumed the event. So for input events, if I press a button, then that event will eventually be read out of a uh, event device. So the kernel knows that the, queue, the input event queue has been emptied, so it knows that user space has consumed the event, so it can then release the wake clock. But in other cases, it's not so straightforward, and you may need some more synchronization with user space. Uh, there are technical concerns. But even allowing for those technical concerns, it's clear that the discussion did not 
continue in a productive and well-tempered manner. And there are some various reasons for this. This was the initial posting back in January 2009. This was the full description of the patch set, which was 13 or so patches. It has two APIs, wait clocks and early suspend. So, so far, so good. The Android platform uses the early suspend API to turn the screen and some input devices on and off. At that point, you're starting to scratch your head, thinking, well, don't we already have interfaces for doing that? I mean, I'm pretty sure that my laptop can turn its screen off. The wait clock code determines when to enter the full suspend mode. And, well, how? What is the full suspend state? What are we talking about here? These APIs could also be useful to other applications where the goal is to enter full suspend whenever possible. Well, when to, it's possible for my laptop to enter suspend whenever it wants. That doesn't mean that I want it to. Does that mean that it's not useful for that case? Um, you read this, you have no idea what the problem being solved is. You have no idea what wake clocks are. You have no idea what early suspend is. All you know is that Android has this code, and they'd like us to have the code as well. And maybe it'll be useful for somebody who isn't Android. But who knows? The other problem, there were various other problems. Um, there was no documentation of the API. So we had these functions, and there was nothing in the documentation directory. So when are we supposed to use these? How are we supposed to use these? We just don't know. It makes multiple new concepts in a single patch set. So back there, we've got wake clocks, we've got early suspend, and we've got entering a full suspend state whenever possible. And these are all related, but it's not obvious how they're related, and certainly not from that description. It actually basically took me, well, so this was hosted in January 2009. I had no idea what the problem being solved was until I met these people in 2010. I like to think that maybe I have some understanding of power management. And then there was the early suspend concept that was conflated with wake clocks. It wasn't very clear where wake clocks ended and early suspend started, or vice versa. So early suspend was um, designed to deal with the case where the device is otherwise idle, but there's still an application doing background work. So that would be, um, I hit the button, the screen turns off, as far as I'm concerned, the phone is now suspended. But it may be that an application has taken some lock, which means that it's still doing work. So an example of that might be a GPS mapper program. If you want your voice navigation to work, then you may not want the screen to be on, but you still want the phone to be awake enough that it can tell you that you need to turn left now. And that means that it needs to keep the GPS lock. It needs to know when to play the sounds telling you to turn left. Early suspend was an infrastructure for allowing you to say, well, suspend as much as you can. If something's still awake and using resources, then suspend all the hardware except the devices that's being used. And then once that lock's released, transition to a full suspend state. So there was already overlap between that and the runtime power management infrastructure in the kernel. And as the runtime power management infrastructure in the kernel has become more advanced, the overlap became even greater. Uh, and initially, it was tied to the implementation of opportunistic suspense. So you'd write, say, echo mem to syspower state. And if there were no wake clocks held, you'd suspend. But otherwise, you'd go to early suspend. And then when the lock was released, you'd go into full suspend. So, and there was this conflation of wake clocks, early suspend, and opportunistic suspend. And it wasn't clear to us where the boundaries were. We agreed with Google pretty much that early suspend could be re-implemented now in terms of the runtime power management and maybe a small amount of glue code that would be required to uh, allow different handsets to identify which devices could be powered down. The embedded world's great. And when I say great, I mean dreadful. You end up with devices where you have multiple pieces of hardware sharing a single clock domain. And if you turn off one of those pieces of hardware, then the others also have to be powered down. Uh, but that dependency isn't necessarily something that you can identify, because it may be that there's actually two clock domains, but on this particular revision, one of them's broken. And so later versions of the chip, you may be able to power down one device without powering down the other devices. It's just the first one you can't. And you can't easily express that 
in terms of a device tree. You end up with a very complicated interaction of devices. So we accepted that even if implemented in terms of the runtime power management infrastructure in the kernel, the dependencies may have to be hard coded on a per device version basis, let alone anything else. Now, in terms of discussion, as I said, Google did not do a great job of telling us what this code did, why we should want this code, why we should merge this code, and we're often not particularly enthusiastic about responding to questions. And there's this perception that every time somebody tries to come up with a solution to Google's problems that don't make people cry as much, Google suddenly pull out another reason why they need this implementation. On the other hand, we've had it's very difficult for one side of an argument to cause an argument to continue. If you have a 3,000 male thread, then it's likely that everybody involves being a little bit more argumentative than they need to be. I'm going to be generous here and say little. <laughs> People tend to adopt interest positions, and this is a natural human viewpoint. If you have presented an opinion, then if people attempt to disagree with your opinion, then it's natural for you to grow more attached to your opinion, especially if they're responding in an argumentative manner. And so we end up with people just getting to the point where it doesn't matter what you say, they're not going to change their minds because you were rude to their mother. And by mother, we potentially mean preferred power management approach. <laughs> but people get like that. It's natural. This happens. The main problem is trying to identify when it happens and then work out a way of restarting the discussion and getting people to be more open about it. Influence, and when I say preferred power management position, that does get influenced to an extent by corporate design. Um, MIMO and MIGO are both designed around the idle uh, loop, runtime, suspend state, so the scheduler handles all of these things. They don't need the wake clock code. They would not benefit from the wake clock code in any way. So if you don't benefit from a patch set, it's much easier to take a viewpoint against it. And I'm not saying that that's because these are bad people who are just towing the corporate line. I'm saying that the company you work for may influence your initial viewpoint of some code, and then that will influence further discussion of it. And if you, as I said, if you as a company don't benefit from this code, then you may feel that there's no reason it's not just a lack of interest in the code. You may then see that this code is trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. They should just adopt your position instead, and then we can all get rid of the code, and everybody's happy. So I think we perhaps did not necessarily engage with Google in the optimal way to come to a peaceful and happy resolution of these issues. Landing code in the kernel is a lot easier if you set out by providing people with a succinct description of the problem you're trying to solve. First of all, convince people there's a problem. Once you've convinced people that there's a problem, talk about how your code solves this problem. Ideally, also talk about how other approaches don't solve this problem but provide as much context as possible. If people are going to, people are going to present alternative approaches. If you've already tried those, then say that's up front. It's massively easier for everybody. Define your terms. As I said, it wasn't just that we didn't understand what wake clocks were for. We didn't understand what wake clocks were. We didn't understand what early suspend was. We didn't understand what this entering a full suspend state was. Describe your terms. If you're going to use a phrase like wake clock, you need to describe exactly what a wake clock is, why I should care about a wake clock, whether I should be unhappy about wake clocks appearing in my code. Make it clear. Make it obvious. Communicate clearly. And separate functional code. So as I said, the original patch set was a mixture of wake clocks and early suspend and the embodiment of opportunistic suspend. And boundaries weren't clear. If I objected to one part of that patch set, so for instance, I found the early suspend approach very unappealing, but because it was part of the same patch set, because it all relies on each other, wake clocks as a result also seemed unappealing. If instead we had had a patch set for wake clocks, 
Because, as I said, you can argue that wake clocks do solve a problem that exists outside the Android world. If I'd had that as a separate patch, that would have been great. I could have looked at that and ignored the opportunistic suspend, and I could have ignored early suspend. And, all right. Kernel developers, it may shock some of you to discover, are actually occasionally social creatures. Also antisocial creatures, but uh, if you have code from somebody you recognize, if you have code from somebody whose taste you respect, then you're likely to be better predisposed to that code. Or you're going to think, well, OK, I don't see what this is for, but I assume that they actually have a reason for it. Whereas if it's from somebody you've never heard of, if it's from somebody who has no code in the kernel, then your immediate response is going to be, well, if I don't understand this, then that's their fault. They're doing something wrong. I don't want their code. And you're going to put much less effort into trying to work out why they're posting this code in the first place. So um, it's worth having recognized names associated with code drops. It makes it a lot easier to at least get a discussion going in the right direction to start with. And then also a lot of the discussion about the wake clocks, a lot of the mails and the threads, ended up talking about things that were completely divorced from the code in question. But then once you're in that discussion, once you're in that argument, it's very easy to carry on in that argument and waste a huge amount of time, and everybody ends up with a more negative opinion of the entire code, because there's just all these people arguing, they won't shut up. <laughs> Go away. So it's a lot easier to just say, that's not relevant, that's not pertinent, this is the problem space we're talking about. This is the problem space that this patch set's trying to resolve. If you want to talk about something else, that's fine, but we should do that in a separate thread. So, um, as I said, wake clocks in the form that Google provided are not mainline. Raphael has provided functionality that is in many ways somewhat equivalent. We have these PM stay awake, PM relax, and PM wake up event calls. These are now in mainline. They're, they allow a driver to say, I just received a wake-up event. And they allow a driver to say, my wake-up event has been consumed. So you can then prevent suspend if one of these wake-up event locks is held. It's a much more minimal implementation than the Google one. Google's wake clock implementation not only takes wake clocks, it also ties it into statistics gathering. It allows you to gain information for both debugging purposes and also to present a dialogue to the user showing them which applications have been responsible for the phone being awake when it would otherwise be asleep. Ideally, we will end up with an interface that, if it doesn't necessarily satisfy all of Google's use cases, if Google still needs extra code, that would be fine as long as we can remain API compatible. If Google extends the implementation of this code, then that's OK. If we can take drivers from Android and put them in the mainline kernel and they'll work and they'll have the correct semantics, then that's wonderful. We would prefer not to have cases where we have to patch every single drive that comes out of Android. So as I said, the binder code in Android is probably never going mainline and it's unlikely that and uh, Google are ever going to feel the need to rewrite a large quantity of code when they have code that works. So Binder's going to remain separate. You're probably never really going to be able to run Android on a mainline kernel, which is a shame in some ways, but it's not the end of the world. If all you need are four platform-independent patches in order to get Android running on your mainline kernel. So that's what we would like to see, even if we don't get a full merge. As I said, we didn't merge Google's code. We did gain some things from the discussion in any case. We've started to tackle a problem that I believe is a genuine problem that affects non-Android use cases, even if the probability of you triggering that are much lower outside the Android world. We've come up with a very long list of ways that the problem does not quite end up being solved. There's all kinds of little irritating quirks that mean that some more attractive approaches are just not practical. And there's been a lot of discussion about how, in the long run, it would be good to be able to have more fine-grained control over applications' resource uses to try to come up with a generic way that we can mitigate the behavior of poorly behaved applications without having to use this sledgehammer approach of 
no longer scheduling tasks. So I wouldn't say it's been a total loss. I'd say that we have gained from this discussion and that if the discussion had gone differently, we could have gained a lot more in a lot less time. So there are lessons to be learned, certainly from the Google side, but I believe also from the kernel developer side. And uh, that's it. That's all I had to say. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, that would be great. So, but the, the issue, the, the, the real bug is that we're going to have another tree outside. Okay. It, it, it's okay. Let me explain. I don't care about a tree, a, a distro tree, where the development happens upstream, and then a third, third point to cut it out, and like the stable tree will never take a, a patch, a private patch. It will mm -hmm. only take a patch that went upstream. Right, that's not actually no. quite true. I there are. Android is doing that. That's smart. Okay. That's the way to do it. So, here we have an opposite thing. Like, we have a okay, so if the situation is that. Where I have patches on the side. Android. Okay, so. <laughs> the discussion here is that it would be preferable not to have Android as a separate kernel tree. If Android wants to stabilize a kernel version by backporting stuff from upstream, then that's a different thing to Android always having these out of tree patches. From a purely philosophical viewpoint, I would love us to be able to boot Android on the mainline kernel and have full functionality. I would like to see every single technical problem that Android has solved in the mainline kernel. On the other hand, I work for a company that I'd like to think is a fairly good open source citizen. I, we, do a lot of code upstream. We pay a lot of people to write code that we don't necessarily use ourselves. When we ship a product, you know, the ones that actually make us money as opposed to Fedora, that's probably not the official corporate line. <laughs> I will be entirely honest and say that we ship a mainline kernel that has some patches that we know will never go mainline because we have some requirements where either it's too time consuming to solve it in a way that will go mainline, or the use case is too niche for it to go mainline, or there is no clean way to solve it, and so we're just going to do this, fix the problem, satisfy the customer, so the customer carries on giving us money so that we can carry on doing open source development for everybody else. I think in the real world, if you are shipping in large volumes, it's unlikely that the mainline kernel will ever completely satisfy you, and you'll always end up with some patches to provide functionality either because there are technical issues with the way Mainline's doing it, or there are policy decisions that you disagree with in Mainline, or sometimes just because it would take you several person years of development to do it in an upstream acceptable manner, and you can't justify that. I would prefer the world not to be that way, but I think the world is that way. Yeah, well, I, and it's going to carry on doing it. We're never going to provide a way where everybody can ship a mainline kernel and be happy. I don't think that's realistic. But we can talk about this later. Any other questions? Yes. So the, um, when I say Android will probably never boot Androids on the mainline kernel, what I mean is that the Android user space will not, probably not ever be fully functional on a mainline kernel. It should be definitely a goal that the mainline kernel will run on any Android hardware, and then you could run a more traditional Linux user space. You could run Mego on top of that kernel. That would be great. I expect that that will happen. But that's what should happen. <laughs> 
Okay, so. Uh, it becomes a de deployment problem, which turns into an expensive problem. The question is um, are we seeing drivers being contributed which have Android dependencies? And no. To be honest, the majority of companies that are producing new Android platforms are, in some cases, not even giving us the source code, even when we have the device. So obviously, there are some issues here, like, say, copyright. Um, and we would like to resolve those. But in some cases, it's going to be uh, the developer may have no interest, but somebody else may then take that developer's code, uh, that vendor's code, and then port it. And they may, look, I'm sorry, but if you want to talk to him, talk to him outside later. Be quiet. Right, I'm, could you please leave? I'm sorry, would you please leave the room? Can you get him out of the room? Okay, so um, yeah, part of it is going to be even when uh, it's not going to be necessarily the upstream vendor who is responsible for getting this code into the mainline kernel. It's going to be some third party who is interested in being able to run, say, Mego on their Nexus One. Well, okay, that's unfair. It's, but there are going to be people who are going to take responsibility for shifting this code in themselves. But it's a lot easier for them to do that if they don't have to create this delta between the drivers, if they can take relatively pristine upstream drivers. And sometimes we've seen that happen, and then that results in they end up as a conduit, a bi-directional conduit between the vendor and the mainline kernel, and then we end up with closer cooperation. If we can demonstrate to vendors that there's an advantage in them having their stuff mainline, then you know, that's better. And sometimes it does take somebody helping them. So we would like to reduce the barriers, make it easier to start that code flowing. And then once that code's flowing, everybody's happier. Any more questions? So all the Android tablets, they look more like laptops, they look more like phones to be trying to... Android tablets uh, in the market at the moment are generally up to about seven inch devices. They're, they're sometimes styled like an iPad. Sometimes they're styled more as a device with more buttons on the side. Right now, they're typically running, the majority of them are produced by small companies. Um, they're often even things like resistive touch screens. They're really low-end devices. They're running pretty unmodified Android, and they're presenting a UI that looks pretty phone-like, or what well, looks pretty much like an Android phone. Obviously, you won't usually have the phone UI, but you'll have the same launcher screen. FYI, Android TVs are coming. Android TVs are coming, apparently, so excellent. <laughs> Yeah. So this is a pretty good retrospective, you know, like deep, heartfelt, hopeful look at what happened in what the and things like that. Well, what in your mind is the future of what's happening going forward and what's the big thing? So the question is, what do I think about what's going to happen in the future? And you know, if I had a better idea about what was happening in the future, I'd have a lot more money than I do. <laughs> but uh, no, what would I like to see happen? I think there's a difference between what will happen and what I'd like to see happen. I would like to see us get to a point where we end up, as I said, with a situation where, in the worst case, the Android kernel is just the mainline kernel with a couple of extra bits of code added. But otherwise, we're completely compatible. That's what I would love to see. Whether we will see that, I don't know. That depends on too many factors. There's too many people involved. There's a lot of code that still has to be written. There's a lot of discussion that still has to take place. I, I wish I could have a more you know, cheerful note to end on. but. As large corporations, um, the question was, is this a problem that we're likely to see in a wider, uh, if we're going to see this more frequently, or if this is something that is just particular to Google in this particular code drop? I don't know. I would guess that we will definitely see large corporations continue to provide code without necessarily justifying it particularly well, without communicating what it is and that this code may then drop on the floor. I think the difference with Google is that we see Google hire a lot of people from our community. We see Google provide various kinds of support to our community a great deal of the time. And I think that we hold Google to a different standard. So if it's been anyone other than Google, I suspect that 
there's been the first couple of patch sets, and then it wouldn't have gone mainline. It would never have been reposted. Nobody would have cared. But because we're seeing these devices out in the open, we're seeing so many people using them, and because we think of Google as our friends in the community, we think of them as a community member, whereas we probably don't think of, say, GE as a community member, I think that the problem ends up that even if you behave in the same way at the start, we end up with a very different situation long term. Yes? Okay, so um, the question is, I think, whether I think that Android would benefit from a slightly more controlled marketplace, one where there's a higher level of review. Uh, well, I'm sure in terms of application quality, yeah, but I also suspect that there would be fewer applications written. And which one you prefer there, it, it's a trade-off. I think there's value in there being a mainstream phone operating system vendor who provides an alternative approach to Apple. I think that in the long run, the market will decide in terms of the application quality and whether having a wider range of applications is better than having better applications. And with luck, I, Android should end up with applications that's just as good. We have people of the same ability coding. The question is whether they'll improve their code if they don't have to, if they'll do it just because they want to. But I would be sad if all significant handset vendors were adopting an Apple approach. I don't think we'd benefit from that. I think we've probably got time for another question and then lunch. People can grab me, I'll be around in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, would it have been easier if the problem had been discussed with the community before Google wrote code, shipped it, and then tied their platform to it? Yes, yes, I do think it would have been easier. I don't know that we necessarily have got a solution, but I think that we would have ended up not spending quite as long. Right. Yeah, right. It's, as I said, you should explain the problem and my list of things you should do should probably have included talk to us first. And sometimes right, companies who have a deadline to ship a product would probably prefer not to spend three months arguing with us on mailing lists, uh, which I can kind of see. But yeah, at least one round of conversation first. And even if it ends with, OK, we're going to agree to disagree on this point. We're going to solve it this way. We're sorry we couldn't come to a consensus. That's better than us just being presented with code later. Uh, so apparently I've actually got a couple more minutes. So uh, at the back there. What do you think the lesson is to Google, who tries to be a good community member, and could miss a patch of the screen, and then it, it turned out to not be anything anyway? Because they could have just released a tarball. You know? Right. So um, what do I think the lesson here is for Google, given that their attempt to be a good community citizen has been largely rebuffed? Uh, I think the take-home lesson here is that sometimes it's difficult to be a good community member. Uh, Arguably, being a good community member would, as Peter said, have involved us having the conversation first before the code was written, and they've already been a bad community member as a result. But you know, that's, that, I don't think that's completely fair. I think, fundamentally, when you are dealing with a group of people who have a wide range of technical expertise, a wide range of beliefs about how things should be implemented, you're not necessarily going to be able to get code into the kernel on the first attempt. And it can take a long time. And ideally, it would be easier for all concerned. But if we just accepted code because they're being a good community member by giving us this code, we would end up with a kernel that looked very different and kind of fell over a lot more. Well, what if they never posted the next round of patches? What if they never posted the next round of patches? Well, it would cost developer time. Um, as I said, sometimes it's hard. If they don't post the patches, and if we don't solve this problem, then we end up with Android being a permanent partial fork of Linux. And I don't think that benefits anyone. But I said, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult to get elected president. But uh, sometimes people benefit from doing so. <laughs> <laughs>
So I think that's it. So thank you very much, everybody.